That's a liner. That's a liner. Birthday car. Marsh got him. Yes. Heads on with the best swim, tails you're in the worst swim, yeah? <sighs> Gotta be a better one pulling like that. These German car are just so cool. And uh, the biggest one so far, really accurate, minimal disturbance. Oh, just seen one out there long. Yes, get in! Oh, I love it when a plan comes together. The heavier baiting is definitely working. Absolutely nailed on that size four long tank X. Get in there. Oh, I'm absolutely blown away. We've been very fortunate to be invited to Bjorn Brockman's um, syndicate up in the north of Germany, about an hour north of Hamburg. Um, and we've picked this place because it, it's very representative of what you would fish in England, what you would fish in France if you were going on holiday, um, you know, and loads of other sort of club and syndicate lakes right the way through Europe. Um, it's about 20 to 25 acres in size, I would say. Average sort of depth, you know, sort of three to 10 foot and a stock of about 160 fish. The biggest of those, there's definitely one 25 kilo fish, which is a 55 pounder, and probably eight to 10 fish over 20 kilos at the right time of year, which in English money are 44 pounders. So, and loads of other 30s. And I've seen from, from filming that's been done here before, they're stunning fish. Everyone loves the German carp, you know, myself and Daryl um, included in that. You know, whether they're 22 pound or 44 pound, I'm sure we're gonna love catching them. Right, heads on me the best swim, tails you're in the worst swim, yeah? <laughs> Go on, you call it, bro. Heads. Tails. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be good to you and I'm gonna go in here. Cause I know you really wanna go down there, don't you? Honestly, I was like, I I thought, you really, no, no, come no, on, no. you really want to go down there. I know you do. <laughs> Be honest. I think I've got a bait boat. I could probably do better in there <laughs> than you could with a bait boat. Only because of the pylons. Yeah that's, yeah, that's what I mean. There's those pylons going over the lake. I fished here before. I think, the, I think this swim is a very good option for the long, long obviously there's fish here now, yes. but you're always in the middle. Yes. And, and I think that's a great option for the week. Whereas I think that's a great option now. Five minutes after I drop my bait. <laughs> uh, and the wind's gonna blow there for a day or so, so it should be, yeah, I think I'll catch there and then we'll see what happens. Go on then, go and get your little uh, black swan. <laughs> <laughs> Got me puppy feet. <laughs> Swim choice wise, um, oh, just seen one out there long in front of where I've chosen, that's nice. Um, Swim choice wise, I knew Daryl wanted to fish down the other end. Um, there's so many fish down there, a big pack of them. You can tell because he gets all jittery and he starts looking and he gets, you know, the fire in his eyes. So I, I knew he wanted down there and I get first choice a lot of the time on these things. So it's obvious that a big pack of fish are there, but there's a big pack of fish in front of where I've chosen as well. And, you know, they say, uh, uh, you know, all your, um, all your battle plans all change on first contact with the enemy. And uh, I was planning to fish longer and fish uh, lead clips if I could, fish wafters. The fish are here and they're really close in. So I've got rods that I had tackled up from Embryo Norton Disney on a shoot last week. They've got helicopter rigs on, little pop-ups. That's what I'm gonna flick out to start off with. We'll see how it goes. That's all right. I've got three rods out. The left-hand one has gone out to uh, my left-hand margin. There's a bush there, saw a couple of fish top and uh, on the echo sound on the bait boat, it looked really clear. I'd also plumbed it with the marker rod. It's a difficult cast, you know, that's why I've used the, um, the bait boat because the wires over, to over the top were a little bit much, but I'm on it. It's gone down with a solid bag and it's, it's absolutely bumped down on the bottom really well. Quite a bit of bait around it. The middle rod is really long where this morning's activity was. It was loads of fizzing, loads of topping going on out there and uh, it just looked like the place to be. And the right hand rod is uh, down with right hand margin. Again, there's a little bit of bubble in there this morning. One fish topped. And I've just cast out of a light lead and uh, spinner rig, kept casting to a good drop and then just sprayed a few boilies over the top. They're in the water. I've done the best that I can and there were fish about. It's just a case of whether they're still there or not. 
Well, the first day is drawing to a close. Um, I've been racing against the light, as is always the case um, on the first day um, on a new lake. It doesn't help that it's weedy out there. The left-hand area where the fish were showing this morning is really weedy, and I tried to get rods out with minimum disturbance. To be honest, the chance for a bite was gone at that point. It, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun was higher in the sky, they'd stopped showing. Um, but I put three rods out close in just to see if I could nick a bite, which I did a few hours later. Um, but the fish charged off sort of to the right and the line went through the weed and as I was trying to steer the fish back round the weed bed and towards me the hook popped out. Um, that was a size 2 curve, fished as a pop-up spinner style, so I moved over to a size 4 wide apex which is a much stronger hook, um, so hopefully when that rod goes again that will be a fish in the net. So the good thing is I know that spot produces fish, I've actually had a cast round now um, later in the day when it didn't look like a bite was going to happen and found a better area just about a rod length further out, so I'm just over 16 rod lengths. I also got caught up in a snag out there, so I know that's there now. I had to go out in the boat, unfortunately, to get the line out. I don't know what it was, it felt like either rocks or, or a tree or something like that. So I've kept away from that on a, on a spot with a little bit of weed, spotted about 10 spawns over the top, um, just a mixture of boilies and maize. You know, there's not any small fish in here, so you don't need to worry about having little bits of particle on. Um, and the fish do love it in here as well. So when you're starting an area off, it's nice to have a combination of baits. You never know what they're going to like. Um, I've thrown sticks quite a few baits over the top of that as well. Just spread it out right around the area just to get them picking, hopefully finding a bait, finding a bait, honing into the baited area and then producing the take. So there's a little tiny isotonic pop-up on that rod on a spinner rig with one of those size 4 wide gape hexes. And then a long area, um, I used Daryl's information from his last session Put the line around the sticks, uh, just on the marker rod, um, just with a lead on the end, no float at all, so you can feel more on the bottom. That's really, really important. I'm using the marker braid and 30 pound armor cord as a leader, so it absolutely flies off the marker rod. And I cast repeatedly out at 26 rod lengths. Sure enough, Daryl was right. There's a lovely gravelly area out there, just sort of, sort of in between the two pylons. And I just kept casting, casting, just feeling what it was like, dragging the lead back. Sometimes it would tap along, sometimes it was smooth. That's a lovely area. If you find something where there's like broken ground, where you've got bits of gravel and then bits of soft silt or, or smooth silt and the ledge just slides along and then another bit it taps, I like that. I like having that sort of variance of uh, substrate out there. So I've got two rods at 26, um, both on helicopter rigs to cast the distance and not tangle, both on spinner rigs, but both with wafters rather than with pop-ups because it's nice and clean out there. I've probably put about 30 spawns out. I've only just finished. My swim looks like absolute carnage. I haven't even got my bivvy up yet. We all know what it's like on the first day on a new lake, especially when you've traveled a long way to get there. You're pretty knackered, you know, you're not making decisions the best you could. You get frap ups, you know, things go wrong and you know, it happens to all of us. So I wouldn't say that I'm massively confident. Um, I know the rigs and baits will definitely work, but not knowing the lake and not knowing how the fish are going to respond to all this commotion, um, I don't know if there's going to be action, but I guess tomorrow morning we're going to see some more fish showing and um, you know, if they get on that bait, I'm confident I'll get bites. Much earlier than I was expecting a bite. Funny, that last 10. I think it's just down here. It is, just under my feet, I think. Put in the net, put in the net. Oh, yes, got him. Oh. Okay, where's he go? It is 32.12. Beautiful. Well, check out the little tiny fins on this guy. These German carp are just so cool. So, so cool. 32.12, this one. Oh. Oh, and he's angry still. He's angry. Up you come. Yeah, man. Look at that. That is like a little baby Arthur from the car park lake back in the day. Absolutely awesome. A lovely way to start. And now what I've got to do is basically get the rod back out on the money. I was using 20 pound touchdown, but I'm going to go down to 15 pound touchdown now, just to make it that bit easier. It's 26 wraps out there in the dark. It is harder for all of us to get it accurate. So slightly lighter line. I had no problems with weed or anything bringing that fish in. Just came in lovely on the surface all the way in. Didn't touch any weed at all. So 
don't need the heavy line and um, getting back out accurate and getting another probably 10 spawns over the top is the way to get another bite. But for now, I am really chuffed. Middle of the night, I think I've got no idea what time it is. But, um, the long rod on where all the activity was yesterday morning absolutely fizzed off. For that, eh? Well, it's uh, 10 to 3. The road is still going. Well, it's the same rod as before. I don't know if that's because the fish are coming from the right hand side down from where Daryl's fishing, or uh, it's just a better spot out there. Well, the first one is always the most important and uh, it came on the long rod under the pylons at 36 wraps where all the bubbling and all the jumping was going on yesterday morning and uh, yeah, it's the first ever fish that I've caught dropping a rig from a bait boat so I'm pleased about that. I'm not sure how good it's looking for the rest of the morning. It sort of it fizzled off, you know, all the casting and getting the rods out yesterday seems to have uh, scared the fish off. I've not seen much this morning so maybe a little move, we'll have to see. Yeah man, check that out. What a proper fighting machine. And the first carp I've caught on my birthday for a very long time. 34 and a half pounds, absolutely pristine. This one was taken on a little 15 mil IB wafter, soaked in isotonic goo. Um, and that was on a size four long shank X, spinner rig style and a helicopter rig. Over loads of link and loads of maize. Awesome result. Uh, looked good for more. Um, done about during the day, the sun's coming up pretty rapid now and it's warming up straight away. So we don't know what daytime action's gonna be like, but um, if I get a couple of these every night, I should be more than happy. Right hand rod again. Fish must be coming from where Daryl is. Probably somewhere in between us, I would guess. Oh no. Put the other line underneath the other rod. Just got to keep the rod low now. There's weed out there. rolling on the line, it's horrible. Proper levery one. Come on, get in that net, get in that net. Birthday carp, Bosh got him, yes. That is awesome, what a day. 29 pound on the button this one, another proper old scaly warrior. Um, character fish, this one, he's got a little tiny black spot on him. Looks quite old, so I'm sure he's known to the locals. But I made sure I got four or five spawns back out in the swim before the recast, wrapped it up, fresh hook on, fresh hook bait on, and I think I've got it out there second cast. But it doesn't matter if you put the spawns out first, you're gonna scare the fish away with bait rather than with a rig, and I think that always means they come back sooner. So uh, another result, and uh, who knows, you might get more later on today. So yesterday, when we started looking, you know, we saw the fish at the far end of the lake. Loads of activity, loads of jumping, loads of bubbling, and just that angling pressure that we put on the fish. It just this morning, 
it just looked desolate up there. I've caught one in the night and maybe I could have caught one again this coming night, but to be honest, it just didn't look right. And this corner, I know with the wind coming and with these trees here, it's just like a little bit of a carp nest. It looks really, really carpy. We've seen the odd one cruising around, little bit of bubbling. And I think, I think there's a really good chance of a few takes over here um, over the next few days. Well, I've had a, a fair few casts about out there and it's really not a lot of choice. You know, the bottom's covered in weed, a lot of debris on there, but so sort of, I don't know, it's about 35 yards out, about six, seven foot off of the trees, there's a silty bit. It's not really hard, but it's clean, you know, it's sort of, the light lead slides through and it's far enough off the trees to give me a good chance. So it's gonna be proper snag fishing. You know, I'm gonna have to fish locked up, rods on a little bit of an angle, sort of taking the, uh, the take and, be on the rod straight away to the right. That left hand tree line was an absolute carp nest. It's a simple case of one pouch of the boilies, get the rig over the top, and it wasn't going to be long before one of them found it. Move out the way, move out the way. absolute battle that was. It's not a big fish, but he was really trying to get in those trees. But um, I'm fishing really, really heavy, locked up. I've got a size four wide gapex on, on a spinner rig, crimped 20 pound hybrid. And that's breaking much, much heavier than that. Um, dropped the lead, 45 pound lead core, and then obviously 20 pound carp line. He's obviously up pretty good because I was pulling his head off at the start. Bush. Oh. -ho. Well, the little move into the snaggy corner has proved a good one. There's a few fish about, you know, after getting the rods out, there's a lot of bubbling going on and a few fish bow waving around, so it looked good for a bite. And this one it hadn't been out too long, maybe a couple of hours, and uh, a proper, proper hairy battle. But I was rigged up heavy, and uh, that's got this one into the net. Lovely. Because I now run a lot of fisheries, I know that the time the fish really whack the weight on is these months, July, August, September, you know, and the more bait you give them, the more they will eat at this time of the year. So it's different from the spring where you're normally flinging bits of yellow and not putting a lot of bait out. And really, I think that's the key is, is learning when to put bait in, how much to put in, so you don't put it in on, on feeding spells and ruin that feeding spell. You get everything sorted in advance and then working out on your lake, how much do you put in after each fish and by what method? Are you spawning it, are you phone sticking it? Um, so it's very much about food at this time of the year. Keeping your bait fresh in the height of summer when it's 29 degrees, which it is today, is of absolute paramount importance. If your bait goes off, you put out carpets of it into your swim, it can actually turn the fish off rather than bring them in. So uh, you do need to pay attention to it. It does take a bit of effort, but it's not impossible to do. So first of all, my maize. This stuff here is sort of three days old already and to keep that nice and fresh, all I've done is just kept changing the water. So if the water goes a bit cloudy or a little bit milky on the top, then I'll pour that water away and I'll just put fresh lake water over the top of it, flush it out and then do it again. If you do that every day or every couple of days, it will keep it nice and fresh. And the best way to know is just to eat a bit of it. I know it might seem minging, but that maze is fine. You know, I can still taste a sort of corny taste to it. 
little bit of salt in there as well. You know, if I can eat it, the fish can eat it. This stuff basically has literally been cooked today. And all the particles that you take with you, obviously you can take dry. And then if you soak them for two or three days before you boil them, they don't need anything like as much boiling. So this has probably been soaked for a couple of days. All I've done is brought it to the boil, simmered it for like 10 minutes, turned it off, put it into a bucket, like red hot, put the lid on, and then it's carried on cooking it for the next few hours. And that's perfect. And this stuff, that is, you can tell the difference between the stuff that's three days old and this stuff. This has got a really rich corn sort of taste. Really salty, because I put quite a lot of salt in the water. That is lovely. Now, if in doubt, with any kind of particle, just throw it away and cook another batch. And then my actual mix this, this particular week is the Link Boilie, which is my favourite boilie for the summer. Um, it's Mainline's new one, come out about a year ago now. And basically everywhere that I've used it, it's caught fish absolutely straight away. It's never been in this lake before and the fish have been crapping it out, it's been in the sling. So that's my number one choice for boilie for the summer. And I've just mixed it with a maize and put a load of water in the bucket as well. So basically the boilies soak up the sort of maize juice and it sort of makes them swell up a little bit. They go a bit softer. And then basically that means that they can't take any of the crap out on the lake bed into them. If they go out bone dry, they can suck up the silt and smell very silty. So by doing that, if you do it in hemp juice, tiger juice, um, the maize juice that I've got here, it just adds something extra to it. And then moving on to the boilies, I've got me 15 and 18 mil link in there. This is one way to keep them fresh during your session, just transfer them into air dry bags. And what I do, I pour them out of the freezer bags into a bucket and then pour them into the open air dry bag and it just stops them going everywhere all over the floor. Obviously you wanna keep them up off the floor if you can. They're lying at the back of your bivvy, rats can get to them and eat through the bags. So I've got them hung up in the trees, again, out of the sun as well. And when they first go into the bags, if you fill them right up to the top, you need to keep moving them around for the first couple of days because little bits of moisture get stuck in between them and that's where the bait can start to go off. And then you can look into the bag and all the stuff in the middle has started to go white. So just keep moving around the whole time. These have been in there three or four days now. They're going harder and harder all the time. Good if you're putting them out with a throwing stick, but really I want to be putting them into that water and letting the maize juice soak into them for at least 24 hours before I put them out. And another way to keep your boilies fresh, I've got a great big call box in the back of my van. It's one of the Coleman variety. And if you put them in there and pack it in tight and keep that lid sealed down, they will stay frozen for two or three days. And the baits now, even four days in, are still cool to the touch. And I'm probably not gonna use all those baits and they're gonna come home with me, go back in the freezer, and they'll be absolutely fine. And as a last result, I always bring some shelf life boilies with me, the high impact range, normally the Bonoffis. Me and Daryl have used those on loads of different sessions all around Europe, on the Dutch Canal, the big lake that we fished in Belgium, and they work brilliantly. So if you've got some of those in reserve, if you do run out of boilies, you're not going to stop getting bites. So this afternoon, I decided to um, move out of the snag swim. You know, the clear spot where I caught the fish from, you know, it's not the sort of spot you want to be fishing while you're asleep in your sleeping bag. You know, you have to be on the rods quick. And uh, the thought of sitting behind a set of rod in there, you know, fishing right up against those trees, you know, not getting onto it quick enough, and then it ended up in the trees, you know, that's bad angling. So uh, the island to the right of the, the snag line as such, there's been a few fish bow waving around behind that today. And uh, the next swim down to, to the right of the snag swim fishes out towards that island. I can't get exactly where they are sort of bow waving around because they're sort of they're in a sort of no man's land and that's why they're there you know happy nice and safe but this swim is the nearest to that and after throwing um, a bare lead around out there a few times i found a really nice gravel patch it's short of the island so it's sort of safe for night fishing and such if i get a take in the night it it won't be able to get to the snag because i'll be on the rod in time and uh, it's fairly open water so i've got two on that really nice gravel patch and it isn't far for those fish swimming around behind the island to come and find that bait um, what i did i used the um, marker float clipped up after finding the spot put the float out onto the spot and then used the bait boat to, to take the bait out there it's sort of lazy spotting really i've been rushing around all day i wanted to put quite an amount of bait out there and the bait boat seemed like the fastest way to do that so I, that's why I've done that and the right hand rod is maybe sort of 40, 40 yards to the right of it to a corner of an island out there on the sort of marginal slope of it it's a small spot takes a few casts to get it in there but I've got a really nice drop on it all of my fish on spinner rigs with pineapple pop-ups 
and I would say I've probably got, I reckon, two kilos of boilies and a kilos of nuts on both spots. So it's quite a bit of bait, but there's quite a few fish in here. And I'm pretty confident, you know, going into the night ahead and for the rest of the session, you know, it's um, the wind's been blowing down to the original swim that I started in and there were fish were there to start with, but there was definitely less there when I woke up this morning. I have since seen the odd fish down there, but for the remainder of this session, the wind is going to push this way. And uh, I'm in this swim, got nice spots. If I get some takes tonight, I'll be really rubbing my hands for the rest of the session. In the early hours, I was dragged from my pit and I wasn't surprised to see it was the left-hand spot and as it came into the net, I could see it was a really good one, a really good common. In the early hours of the morning, my right-hand rod was away. It had kited as they often do at range and I could feel the line grating almost from the word go. Eventually, the fish stopped moving as I guess I'd pulled it back into the weed bed it had kited around. It's really easy to panic at this point and pull too hard. I've made that mistake before, so now I tell myself to calm down, take my time and let the fish change its direction and pull itself out of the weed. It doesn't always work, but on this occasion the spool started turning, which means the fish has worked its way free and once it's moving, steady pressure on the rod keeps it inching back towards me. It's a tense time, but if you stay calm and patient, you can often win the battle. Oh, I never said a word because I thought I was going to lose it. Another mid-30, 30, 34 pounder from in the night. And the most interesting thing about this capture is what is in the sling. And with it resting for a few hours, it has passed loads and loads of maize into the sling, like loads. And that is a great indicator of what the fish is eating. There's a bit of boilie in there as well, so it's definitely been eating that. But maize seems to be the dominant food source. So tonight, I'll definitely be putting one rod on a stack of maize, keeping the other one on a boilie and uh, we'll see if we can get two rods going because at the moment all the action is coming to one rod and on a long session like this where I'm sort of plotted up in the middle of the lake I need to think about the tactics I'm using, when I'm baiting up, how much I'm putting in, what I've got actually on the rig uh, in order to make the most of the situation. Daryl's being Daryl and dotting around everywhere, fishing loads of different swims and getting bites and um, with me sort of staying put there's nowhere for me to move to really so I need to think about how I'm fishing and making the most of these shorter feeding spells. Well, here's last night's result. 37 pounds of German common carp. And uh, the biggest one so far came over the heavily baited area with the link boilies and the tiger nuts from the bait boat. Really accurate, minimal disturbance. And then casting those pineapple pop-ups on the spinner rigs over the top, lethal. Right, we've had hardly any action, well, no action in the day really. I just think it's non-beneficial to have the lines in the water. Sometimes you're fishing, you're trying to maximise the most of the time you've got, I understand that. But um, I think it's probably better to have the lines out, out of the swim, put some bait out, you know, let it do its thing, smell in the water without the lines in, and uh, put them out again in the, um, in the evening once there's a chance of a bite. It gives me a chance to um, nip to the hotel, have a quick shower, freshen up, and uh, yeah, I think that's gonna be the winning formula.
So I'm only two nights into a session on a brand new lake. Um, obviously the learning curve at this point is very, very steep. And um, with that fish I had in the early hours of the morning, the, the best bit about it, other than obviously the fish itself, was seeing the sling um, when I got it out of the water this morning, it was full of maize. There was boily in there, but not much. So uh, I'm going to swap one rod definitely onto maize tonight. Um, but what I've decided to do now is to bait up heavily now. Um, I've already wound the rods in. Um, it's just about 10 o'clock, as you can see weather-wise. Um, there's not cloud in the sky today. Perfect sunbathing weather, but not perfect fishing weather. Um, and uh, see a lot of people on, on weeks holidays out in France and stuff, they've got to have rods out, you know? They've got to fish like 24 hours a day. They pay for their week, they're gonna fish no matter what. And uh, you can end up what I call drowning the swim by having your lines out all the time. So now I'm a couple of days in, it's obvious the bites are coming at night and sometimes first thing in the morning. Uh, the wind has now changed to an easterly, and they say wind from the east catch the least. Um, and with it being hot and sunny, an open water area in six or seven feet of water is almost certainly not gonna produce in the middle of the day. So by bringing the rods in, you're not missing anything. And what you're actually doing is giving those fish an opportunity to find the bait, come across it. There's no line in the water. That's 100% the scariest thing in fishing is the line. Much more than the rig or anything else, or even the sound of the spawn. Lines out all the time. They know they're being fished for. They start avoiding the area. So bait for a few hours, sitting there with no lines in it, is only going to help the action um, you know, when it is feeding time. I'm casting slightly upwind because when the spod hits the clip, the, the bow in the line is going to pull it in the windward direction. So I'm aiming slightly right. And uh, quite a few of these are going more, well, they're landing on what's going to be the middle rod tonight that's going to have the maze on it. So I need to aim even more right to get them to land over the right hand rod, which has been doing all the bites. But now the wind's changed direction. I've seen, already seen a couple of fish ahead of me on the far bank and it looks like some fish are moving down the lake. So it might be tonight that the middle rod is the one that goes. Um, but, you know, doing this now means there's no commotion later on. That's better. Um, and I can get the rods out, you know, sort of late afternoon, early evening and uh, hopefully get an earlier bite. By baiting earlier in the day, I'm gonna leave the rods out all day. If you're at a holiday venue in France, then sort of after breakfast has been delivered to your swim. You know, if it looks like this and it looks rubbish and you're in deeper water, out in open water, bait up, go and see your pals, have a beer in there, swim. If someone's doing like what Daryl's doing, where he's, he's snag fishing in the day, you know, go and, uh, go and sit with him or go and do that sort of fishing yourself once you've done this. And um, just know it's sitting out there working for you. So when you come back and the fish are in your part of the lake, they've been feeding a little bit during the day because there's no line. Building confidence, hopefully you'll get more. Perfect. So lovely 37 pound common last night, really pleased with that. It's a lovely spot, sort of a gravel bar and I'm fishing on the near side of it. And they're obviously feeding quite well at night. I could spot it out there as accurately as need be. You know, I could get it on the, on the size of the clear spots very easily. But the fact is I had the bait boat with me. I wanted to get a lot of bait out there. I wanted it really tight. And I can do that with a bait boat in no time at all when it minimalizes the, uh, the amount of the disturbance on the water. So that's what I've done. I'm happy with the spots. I've changed hook bait. That's one thing that I have done. You know, I've caught first fish on uh, Banoffee Wafter and I've had the other one since on uh, Pineapple Pop-Ups. 
but it, having seen that Kong really pass in the bait, they're obviously eating it. Um, I've gone with a, a normal like a match to hatch colour, but I've still gone with the pop-up. That's mainly to keep the hook in tip-top condition. You know, I'm using sharpened hooks, and uh, when they're on the bottom, they do have a tendency to sort of corrode and lose their edge. So those pop-ups are sat just like on a spinner rig. They're only sat maybe an inch or two off the bottom, very, very close to the bottom feed. So when they come in on that, hopefully they're homing in on that smell. And uh, yeah, I feel really confident. It's just a case of, are they here? Because I haven't seen them, and I'm just hoping this wind means they are. Yes, got him. On lakes like this, it's so important to resist the temptation to recast at first light if two rods are still left on the spot. This is the best time for a bite in summer, and even one recast can spook feeding fish off the area and ruin the chances of another take. The less fish in your lake, the better it is to adopt this tactic. On heavier stock lakes, I'd often rebait and recast straight away at any time, even at first light, as more bait can prolong feeding. But on this lake and many others like it, the fish appear to spook off baiting in the dark and bites can dry up. It's a case of trying both tactics and then switching to the one that works on your lake at that time of year. Another absolutely pristine German mirror. Uh, this is the one that came in the dark and I chose not to recast that rod in the hope that the other rod would go and sure enough it did. So I've got that one to show you in a minute as well. But um, two bites in the night, I'm well chuffed. I found out Daryl's not had anything last night and I really thought he was gonna catch. I thought he was in the best spot and um, the wind was hacking in there. He reckons he may have put a little bit too much bait in, but uh, you know, I'm surprised I got two bites last night, but it certainly shows that the, um, the heavier baiting is definitely working. Yeah, man, proper pretty one. This is one of the stockies into the lake in recent years. Imagine this when it's 40 or 50 pound. Uh, 21 and a half it went, and most importantly, another bite off that spot. So the middle rod this time, so it's about probably half a rod length to the left of where all the action's been coming. And I didn't redo the rod that I caught the 25 pounder on, left it out of the water, and then at first light, this one roared off. And it's the first bite I've had on two grains of maize and a bit of plastic. And that was based on that fish yesterday that was crapping out all the maize into the sling. So the plan has definitely worked. I still feel I can get more in the night out there. So maybe tonight I'm gonna to group all three rods together really tight. Oh, all right, mate, all right. Let's give you a dunk. There we go. And I'm gonna put all three rods together really tight. And then if they go, don't recast them and see if I can get three bites in the night. Um, and then later in the session, I may even move right over to the far side just for the days. So I've seen fish showing over there but I know if I do it, I'll probably cut that other area off. So for now, the plan is working. I've got him. It's a little fully scaled. Well, bit of a quiet night for me last night. 
put a lot of bait out yesterday and I think a few fish visited the spot. One of the rods was sort of dragged down the gravel shelf in the night. It's quite a bit of wind and weed on the line, you know, and the tension built up on those little two and a half ounce leads and either a fish bumped into it or it just gave way in it. I think that sort of, that was my chance gone as such, but this morning, come back into the snag swim. I lost one really quick after getting out. I wasn't sort of positive enough on the rod, but the second one, I was straight on it, really pulled from the off, got him away from the trees, and this is the result. Lovely fish, probably an upper double. Um, looks really good for some more bites out there. And again, for this evening, I move back to the other swim, and I'm confident some more action there too. Right, and right again, um, surprised it's happened so late to be honest. It's kiting well right, which is good, keep it away from the other line. Sun's pretty high in the sky now, I'm guessing it's sort of half nine-ish, something like that. It's not a big one, but it's an angry one. Oh, tipping over its dorsal there. It's a lovely scaly one. Come on, you. Come on. Into that net. Bosh, got him. Come here, mate. There we go. What an absolute stunner that is. Just over 17 pounds. Fought like an absolute demon. And I wonder if putting in more bait yesterday has brought in a pack of the smaller fish. I've had a 25, 22, and now a 17, but I'm gonna keep going. I'm going to put a lot more bait in at lunchtime today, put all the rods out early and see if I can get an earlier bite because doing it yesterday seemed to sort of delay when the first bite came. So especially in the summertime when you're feeding a lot, you need to think about when it's going in, how much you're putting in, when the bites are coming and basically just honing everything to suit the conditions when you're at that lake that time. I'm going to keep changing things slightly until I find the winning formula. using uncharacteristically tight lines. You see, if I pull that down, that's banging up against the rod there because it's so tight. And the reason for that is there's a lot of weed out there and the first fish I hooked into on the very first day took a load of line, went through the weed beds at an angle and I ended up pulling out the fish. So I learned from that and basically tightened everything up from then on. I'm fishing out at a reasonable distance, 104 yards. The water's only shallow, about seven foot deep. So some of the line is going to be on the bottom near the rig anyway, and I've got very, very few liners, maybe just the odd bleep here and there, but generally I just get a take out of the blue, which means the fish haven't been coming into contact with the line, so even though it's tight, it's not prohibitive and it's not stopping fish coming into the swim. The added advantage of having a tight line, if the fish kites left or right, when I get it closer in, I'm playing it underneath the other lines, and there haven't been big wee beds sort of left and right of where I've been fishing, um, which I didn't know at the time, so I've not really been getting fish caught up in the weed. Um, occasionally they've moved into weed that I didn't know about and I've managed to pull them free, um, but having those tight lines just allows me to guide the fish underneath when they get really close in. And you want to be thinking at the start of a session, where am I going to land my fish? Are they going to come into contact with the other lines? And if I was fishing much slacker, when the fish came in close, you know, you see me passing the rod underneath the others, um, you know, at the end of a battle, if the lines were slack there, I'd be in real trouble. There's no point using back leads in this situation because the weed is up and down like an egg box out there. So the line's not going to be on the bottom. And if the fish heads not going through a line that is back leaded, you're really in trouble. So in this sort of situation where there's a lot of weed around, I think a tight line is much better. I'm using the stow bobbins, which are my absolute favorite. I know there's a fashion for using ones like the black and whites now, but I can't see any advantage the black and whites have got over a stow. I love the fact that it's semi-fixed to the line. You know, any movement forwards at all, basically, is just straight away is registered on that bobbin. There's no line running through it. 
because it's semi-fixed. And I love the way they look. I love the way that they ping off the line, you know, when the fish does start to take some line. And uh, I can't see myself changing from anything else. So the line I've got on is 15 pound touchdown that's sailing out there. I'm fishing really tight now. I've got all three rods facing out towards those pylons. They're probably only three or four foot apart. And it's important to have a line that casts really well and you can fill the lead down with um, to get those sort of distances with pinpoint accuracy. It's all well and good saying, oh yeah, I can cast 100 yards or 120 yards. But if you can't drop it on a dustbin lid, then it is definitely going to work against you. They're on the Bayesia reels, the brand new ones, the matte black versions, absolutely beautiful reels and absolute Rolls Royce. Uh, can't recommend these highly enough. Obviously, they are a lot of money, but they are absolutely top of the range. And the most important part of fishing at long distance is the rod. And these are 12 foot, three and three quarter Infinity DFX 45s. Really, really good recovery, which means they snap back straight after you finish the cast really quickly. The line flies through them and absolutely sails out there. And these for me are a sort of multi range rods. You might be scared by the three and three quarter test curve, but you've seen how much they bend when I'm playing the fish. And if I was fishing sort of 20 yards further than this, you know, I'd really struggle with a three and a quarter. So the three and three quarter for me, when you're big fish fishing with heavy lines at long distance, that's what you want to have on. And if I had to go further, I would scale up to the 13 foot three and three quarter because it casts that much further. When you're playing the fish with these sort of stiff rods, you want to let the tip of the rod do the work, especially when the fish come in close. You know, if it's bending right through to the midsection, you're putting too much pressure on the fish and that's where you can pop hooks out. So you'll see a lot of the time, I'm holding the rod above the reel and just absorbing the lunges of the fish in the latter stages of the fight and then you won't pop hooks out. And the whole lot is sitting on my favourite single system. This is the stainless version. You can see that is absolutely rock solid there. I've got the solar backrest, which really grip the rod. You know, they're not getting pulled forwards at all. And you can see there, I'm using the new digital Delkims just out this year. I've got them set on medium sensitivity. So you can see, you know, even if no line is being pulled through because they work on vibration, I'm getting really good indication and pretty much every bite is just pulled up tight and that bobbin's tried to get into the buzzer, the rod's bucking around in the rest, off it screams and you get a roaring take. So that's the hardware I'm using on this particular session. It's no surprise that Daryl is using a virtually identical setup. It's our first choice for this sort of multi-range fishing. Well, we might have just seen uh, how that fight started and these snag battles, they're all won or lost in the very first few seconds. If you can get that first few yards back on them, turn them and get them away from the snags, then you're on to a winner. This isn't a very big fish to be fair, it's a really small one, smallest one so far, but even, that, even little ones can pull hard and you've still got to get back, get back from the water's edge rather than try and wind and crank. And um, it's worked perfectly again this time. Absolutely nailed. Bosh. Come on. Well, not the biggest fish in the lake, but they all count. It's proper hit and hold fishing in this swim, and I'm sure there's some more fish to come, much bigger than this, hopefully. But um, I'm really keen to get the rod back out. The wind is just trickling in this corner. Lovely. It just looks perfect. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed, the next one might be a bit bigger. sorted again for the night ahead and uh, you'll see me and Daryl using the distant stick technique pretty much in all of our fishing. Once we've found a spot um, and especially once we've had a bite off it we want to get back on there again and again and again. Using the cooler distant sticks which you've got the grooves in 
which means the line doesn't come off too quickly and you don't end up with a massive bird's nest. It's a great idea. We didn't think of it. It was Jim at Jag that did it. And you'll notice when I'm going round the sticks, I'm going round in a figure of eight direction um, rather than just round and round. And that again stops the line from slipping off the sticks. If, if that happens, you just get a massive loop of line. It's impossible to undo. You have to cut it all off and start again. And when I'm winding back off, you see I'm using a little tiny bit of sponge, just an old dish sponge. And this one's really worn down, so it's gone really soft. And as I'm winding the line on, it's going on tight and it's going on wet and it's going on clean. So obviously it doesn't show up so much in the water because all the grit sticking to it makes it more visible and it casts like an absolute dream. You can come back off the distant sticks through that bit of sponge with it nice and wet and whack it immediately without having to pay the line out first and get it wet and get it straight before you really whack it. So that's a major, major edge having one of those. Nick it off your missus out of the kitchen and basically put it in a cup like I've got there, just a bit of lake water in it and that will mean that you never frap up again. I've caught a couple of nice fish from the snag swim today, but it's time to move to get back into the open water and get onto those gravel spots. I'm going to make a rig change. I have been catching on pop-ups, but you know, the water's coloured, we're catching at night, so if you take away the pop-up's greatest asset, you know, it, you might as well be fishing in the bottom. And for me, I've caught loads of fish on Bonoffi wafters in Masterclass 2 in Belgium, caught some absolutely massive fish. It's a really simple rig, you know, we're talking very, very basic, but it just works, you know, there's nothing on it. And I think the reason it really works, because there's nothing on it, there's nothing for them to feel, and there's nothing for them to eject. They take that bait, they move away, they hit the lead with that ultra sharp hook, and that's them done. I'm only gonna fish two rods tonight, and the reason for that is I think I'm confident Compromising, you know, when you've got two rods on one spot, you end up not putting it on exactly the right part of that spot. So one rod exactly where I caught that 37 pound common, I'll be really happy with that. One on the right hand spot as well. I think it's highly likely there's still quite a lot of bait out there on the bottom, but you never know, you know, I could have been cleared out. For that reason, I am going to put eight spots of rod out. Just enough to get them sniffing round, but not enough to overdo it if there is still some down there. And hopefully we'll get another one tonight. The three lines are going out beautifully off the tips there, tram lining out to the spot. And I've decided to fish all three rods on that area tonight. The left hand spot didn't produce anything. I hung it out to about midday. Although I saw a fish show there, what it means is I can put a rod back there. If one of these goes tonight, I can cast that rod onto that spot. I know it's 16 and a third wraps. I haven't put any more bait into that area. The ducks have still been diving on it from time to time. If I am lucky enough to get bites off of that right hand area, rather than the rod sitting up against the bivy, I can put it out in the dark there, leave the other two on the spot and hopefully that will produce more bites. So what I've basically done with the baiting, it went up to 29 degrees again today. So it would not have been fun spawning in there. I would have done it if I had to, um, and I did spawn earlier on in the session for two reasons. One, I didn't want to go out in the boat. The water's quite shallow. Didn't want to potentially spook any fish that are in the area away. Um, and the second reason is people that fish these sort of venues all around Europe often can't use the boat and they have to fish from the bank. So I wanted to show that it could be done from the bank. Now that's been working and I can use the boat, I thought I'd go out there, just one trip, put the marker float out first, go around the sticks 26 times, put the float out, let it up in the middle of the spot so I knew how much right and left I had to go from, from the float, go out in the boat, edge up to the spot, spread the bait all round it so I knew it would be over all three rods and then the wind would push me away and then I'd move back up again and spread it again. And I find it's better to throw the bait from a little bit further away so it spreads out a little bit. The tendency when you're out in the boat is to put everything in one spot because you can do it so accurately um, and then your rods are splayed out and there's only really bait over one of them. I did about half, maybe two thirds of one of those 11 litre buckets. Again, maize and boilies that had soaked up the maize juice. Um, and I did throw some further, which I've not done with the spawning. I threw some further behind the spot to try and draw fish off that far bank. Um, but for tonight, um, you know, I'm pretty confident that at least one of these rods is gonna go, if not more. 
um, but the one that was on the left has now leapfrogged over the top of the rod that I've been getting the bites on, so it's further right, and I've just dropped it back. When I've gone around the distance sticks, I've dropped it back by about six foot, so it's not cutting the other rod off. So if those fish are coming from the right-hand side, I'm hoping that any of the rods could go. The left-hand rod's fished six foot slightly further out. Um, that's the one that's got the two grains of maize and a bit of plastic on that I had that lovely scaly 20 pounder this morning on. Um, and the right hand rod I've put a match the hatch wafter on it. Um, so I've got a link wafter that's got cork dust in it to, to give it some buoyancy. That's been soaked in the garlic goo which I've had loads of fish on pretty much on every lake that I've fished. And it's more matching what I've been feeding the whole week. You know, you think the fish that have been coming into the swim and not getting caught have been eating that bait, eating that link, eating it, eating it, not getting caught on it. Maybe they've avoided the high attraction of the isotonics and the, and the corn sticking up off the bottom. Maybe they've just been eating the bottom baits and maybe I'll snare one of those fish on that, on that rig. If that rod doesn't go at all tonight and the other two do, then tomorrow night I definitely won't have it on there. But when you're learning a new lake, it's good to change things up a little bit. And it might be that that rod goes first, you know, and I put it out on the other spot and it goes on the other spot as well. And then I know the fish are really switched on to having the link. So, you know, it's uh, really interesting when you get into a new lake working out how to unlock the code, what's really working at that time of the year. Everything I learn is gonna get written down on the phone because I'll definitely be coming back here and then I can employ them same tactics again, you know, another summer. Well, I do love it when a plan comes together. It's not even dark yet and uh, we've had our first bite over that heavier baiting. And it's the middle rod, which is in the same spot as the right hand rod's been in, still on the isotonic, and that has gone first. Right, it's well clear of the other lines. But I have got a big weed bed out here, so try and steer him. Yeah. I keep the rod low. Hopefully he'll just keep moving. He's going more over there. There he is on the top. That's good, that's above the weed bed. And there is a tree out there. That's why I'm playing it so hard. surface. Just keeping the rod low, trying to keep the fish up in the water. If you put the rod high, they tend to dive down deep. calls it get in that net bosh got him yeah man a good start hopefully the shape of things to come it looks like a 30 as well well did i or did i not say it looked really carpy and it doesn't get much carpier than this. 32 and a half pounds on the middle rod, which used to be the right hand rod. That isotonic wafter doing the business again. Absolutely nailed on that size four long shank X. Fish D-rig style with a D-rig kicker. Spinner style as well on a helicopter rig over loads and loads of bait. And uh, that seems to be the key now, getting the bait in earlier, not baiting up again before I cast out, just putting the rod straight out and it took a few casts to do it as well. And I've got to be honest, I am surprised it has happened as quickly as this, but what a pleasant surprise. So it's the left hand rod again, and I'm not surprised really, you know, the fish are coming to that gravel patch, they've been cruising around behind the island there and just working their way onto it. Obviously a change to the Banoffee Wafter rig, and it certainly hasn't hindered things. Oh, 
hard to tell where they are, it's just chugging through the weed a little bit, I can feel now. Picking up another rod is sometimes completely unavoidable when fishing three rods so close together at range, especially with weed around. Over the years I found it's best to slacken off the rod on the rest, loosen the clutch or even open the bail arm to allow the fish to come slowly in, dragging the offending line above it. Very tense, it's caught round the other line. So horrible, we've just got no real contact with the fish. Hopefully the second line doesn't slide down far enough to pop the hook out, and if you take your time and don't panic, you can often land more than you lose. Oh, what a palaver. But it's in the net, thank God. And the road is awake. character this one look at him or her probably big old distended belly proper Italian looking strain 34 pounds taken on the left hand rod two grains of maize and a grain of plastic just to give it a little bit of buoyancy on a size 4 long shank X and I waited all night for another bite I thought I was going to get loads last night getting that bite really early was a really good sign got the cast back out there sort of after a couple of goes um, and nothing happened all the way through the night and um, this one's come at first light, which is a fantastic time. It's getting really warm already. And um, I reckon my chance of a bite, I've probably got another hour or two out in open water. And then if I want to get a bite after that, I'm going to have to move the rods over to that far side. But for now, I'm absolutely chuffed with this proper character. The first consideration of any rig when you're constructing it is, is it going to be anti-tangle? Um, the second one is, will it suit the substrate it's going to end up landing on? And then from then on, you can start looking at hooking arrangements and how effective is it going to be at hooking the fish. But if it goes out there tangled in the first place, or it doesn't match the lake bed, then the rest of it doesn't matter. So I thought I was going to be fishing with leg clips here. Um, I've moved over to helicopter rigs, which I've used a lot in recent years. And the main reason for that is because they cast brilliantly and they are also very, very good at anti-tangle, especially if you're going to use a small hook bait. Um, and because there are no nuisance fish in here, we've been able to get away with much smaller hook baits. I've brought everything with me. So I've got them up to 24 mils and down to 10 mils and I've settled on a 15 mil wafter. And that sometimes on, on a lead clip can be problematic when you're casting it a long way. There's not enough weight in the hook bait to keep it away from the tubing and sometimes you can get tangled. So that's why I went over to a helicopter rig. I'm using a lead coil leader that I've made myself. Um, they're just about three feet long. The other thing about the helicopter is when I'm casting it into weed, I can move the top bead up that bit of lead core um, and by moving that up the hook link can slide up on the cast the lead can go down into the weed then it, the hook link just finds its natural position and if it is really hard on the bottom like I've got out on that spot it will probably come down and rest next to the lead again and I'm using very tight lines so the fish is hooking itself as much against the tight line as it is that four ounce distance lead. I've cut the swivel off the lead and that's fished on a heli safe so that basically the lead comes off when I get the bite. And the reason for that is there's loads and loads of weed in here. If you've got the lead on the whole time, it keeps the fish lower in the water and it can end up going into a weed bed and you can end up losing it. So I don't dump the lead all the time. If there was no weed at all, I'd be putting the little collar in the heli safe and I wouldn't be dumping it. But here, if you're gonna get snagged up in the weed and end up losing everything, I'd rather lose the lead than lose the fish and lose the lead and the lead core and everything else. So the hook link itself is made from boom material. It's what I use for probably 90% of my fishing now. And just with the 25, or in this case, the 35 pound boom on, I just know it's not gonna tangle. And I've scaled up to 35, because we're fishing for bigger fish. We don't know what snags and stuff are out there. And it's just that bit stiffer. And with big fish and great big mouths, you know, and using bigger hooks, you can get away with a stiffer material. So that's sliding up and down 
that lead coil leader, I've got a size 11 ring swivel crimped onto one end of it, and then I've got one of the spinner swivels crimped onto the other end. Now you can cut the ring off of the spinner swivel, or now we actually do them just the swivel itself for clipping the hook onto. And fishing with wafters, it's probably better not to have that ring there. It hasn't really got in the way of me getting bites in this session, but if I knew I was going to be doing that at the very start, then I probably would have cut the ring off, just so there's a little bit less weight around the eye of the hook. I'm using a size 4 long shank X, and even the guys that are working with us, some of the crew, are like, oh, are you using the new pattern of hook? It's gone so out of favour, the long shank X, that they thought it was a new hook. They'd never seen it before. And um, I basically used the Gamakatsu long shank to design this hook, whatever it was, probably 15 years ago now. And uh, the thing I didn't like about the Gamakatsu, the barb was really big, so we made the barb much smaller, and the eye wasn't in turn. So we've interned the eye a little bit. But on this particular setup, I've interned the eye even more. So I'm just putting it inside the crimp tool and then just applying pressure to the back of the shank and just bending the eye in more, and that just helps it to flip over even faster and catch hold. I'm using one of the new D-Rig kickers on that. Um, on a normal hook link, you would keep the taper on the bottom of that kicker, but I've just snipped it off to make it easier to get over that spinner swivel. So what you do when you're threading it on, the large end goes on first, then the thin end. I've already put a micro ring swivel onto it before I do that, and I do push that on before I cut the taper off. It just makes it easier to get the ring of that ring swivel onto there. So once it's onto the hook, I'll clip the hook onto the spinner swivel and then I'm basically using my t-shirt and, and, the, and the crimp tool to pull it down over the top of the spinner swivel to make sure that the hook can't get off during the battle. And that, that is probably the hardest bit of the whole rig. I wet normally the spinner swivel just with a bit of saliva, clamp down on the, on the pliers really, really tight and then just use the friction of my t-shirt to pull it down onto it. And once you've done it once, you can make the hook barbless once you've got the fish in, slide everything off and slide it back onto another hook. And these D-Rigs will last 10 fish, 20 fish if you want. You know, they're really robust bits of kit and uh, I don't like throwing anything away. If there's nothing wrong with it, use it again. Obviously, if the hooks have gone blunt, then I'll be changing them. And I'm not sharpening my hooks at all here. Straight pointed hooks like this long shank X are very, very difficult to sharpen effectively. And where we've got gravel and stuff out there, I don't really want to sharpen it. I don't want to take the point down too fine. My hook holds have been brilliant. I've landed virtually every single fish on this. And I'm convinced that that kind of setup with a stiff hook link, the spinner swivel, and a long shank straight pointed hook, it just turns so quickly. I think the first time they suck it in, you just nail them and the bait is a 15 miller, it's an IB wafter, which is a brilliant bait on its own, but I've just soaked it in the isotonic goo, and that has been by far the best hook bait. If you've forgotten about the long shank X's, put them back into your fishing, because they are super, super efficient. I love John Wilson strike, haven't you, in the morning? Carp number two of uh, a good night, really, the gravel spot. It's a quite slopey one. The change of the flat leads and to the wafters has proven a good one. Two fish, this is obviously the smallest one, and another one in the uh, retainer to show you. Well, first carp from last night. An absolute pearl, a lovely fish. Probably another stocky. Again, taking on the um, Bonoffi wafter on the very simple dark matter rig and a size six wide apex. This is a rig that I've used so much in the past, but I'd, I've come away from it, you know, everyone's using spinner rigs and they are super, super effective. But if you think the fish are really on the bait, and especially in the summer, you know, when you're summer fishing, the fish are really eating. In the spring, single pop-ups catch you loads of fish, but in the summer when they are eating bait, it seems silly sometimes not to fish on the bottom. And this rig, loads of people, the first thing they're gonna look at it and go, that's braid, that's gonna tangle. And I'm gonna talk you through the components that, that make sure that it doesn't tangle. So first of all, dark matter tubing. Tubing is more anti-tangle than leg core. You know, you can use this rig on leg core, and if you're, if you're really sort of meticulous with your casting and smooth and hit the clip 
at just the right sort of force and it shouldn't tangle. But dark matter tubing is thicker, it fills out the, um, the tail rubber that much better and you don't end up with that sort of, that little, that little edge that the brake can catch on. That goes onto a hybrid leg clip and I've got a three and a half ounce flat pair on there. And the reason that I've got the three and a half ounce flat pair is one night fishing to that gravel slope, the tension of the wind and the weed on my line meant that it sort of came trundling back towards me. This three and a half ounce flat pair since then has stopped that altogether. Really important for a braided hook link when you're gonna be casting out is this ring swivel. You know, a lot of people do quick change systems these days they, and they're putting bits of rubber and all sorts on there. Now I can't guarantee if that won't cause tangles, but what I can guarantee is if you use it like this with a ring swivel tied directly to it and the rig is roughly seven to eight inches long. This is dark matter in 20 pounds. And uh, you, the next most important thing is the size of the boilie. You know, if you're gonna use this rig, you can't just put a 15 mil boilie on there and expect it not to tangle. It won't tangle sometimes, but it will tangle sometimes. So it's, it's a bit inconsistent. And when you're sitting behind rods all night, you really, really don't want that. So if you're gonna use it, 18 to 20 mil bait or a snowman rig, it's just, it's just important to have that weight and that wind resistance during the cast that keeps it away from the lead during, during the cast. I always use this rig with size six wide gape. A wide gape X in this case, because I'm fishing in quite weedy situations for big fish. But the, the single most important part of that is the knotless knot and how many turns you do. I'm using the boilie, just brushing the bend. You might have two, three, three mil clearance on the bend. And then I've whipped down past the point down level with the barb so that when I tighten it, it ends up still level with the point. And if maybe a fraction closer to the barb than the point, you know, you don't want it to be the other way. If you haven't done enough turns, you'll have what I call a hair tangle occasionally. And in that situation, when the boilie wraps around the shank like that, I have lost a lot of fish when that happens. So make sure you wrap down the shank far enough and the finished rig, the boilie is exiting somewhere between the point and the barb, closer to the point, but not closer to the eye. So there you have it. A very, very, very simple rig. But trust me, I've caught fish from some of the UK's most difficult venues on this and all over Europe. It's just an absolute winner when you want to fish a wafter or a bottom bait on the clear bottom. We got this one. I think this might be all right. It's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. Well, that's all right, that is. That's what I wanted. One of the mirrors, the nice old ones. On the old back wind. Come on, that's more like it. Well, finally, a better fish out of the snaggy corner. Came this afternoon, again, simple tactics. A little yellow pop-up on a little, uh, a little pop-up rig that I sort of concocted after losing a few fish. One thing that I sort of changed was I stopped using sharpened hooks. I'm uh, using them straight from the packet because I was thinking that the sharpened hooks were sort of cutting out under heavy pressure. And uh, this is the result, an absolutely perfect, crusty old German 35 pounder. If ever there's a time to be using fish meal baits, it's in the warmer weather and in the summer. And uh, for this session, I've been using exclusively Link. Have used a few tiger nuts, but not many really. You know, I think these fish in here really do like boilies. The water's really warm, and that's when fish meals come into their own. You know, it's, it is prime time to be feeding that sort of bait, and uh, it's really worked well. One tip that I could give you, just rather than just catapulting in straight out of the bag, which obviously works, but to pre-soak them, you know, I like to put my bait into a bucket 
add some lake water or the liquid from the tiger nuts, you know that that's a really good thing to do. But I like them to be sort of semi-saturated, so they've taken on the water, and you'll see the attractors, they come out into the water in the bucket, and they become saturated in that. And what that means is when they go in the lake, they don't suck up the bottom smells as much, and uh, also they're much easier to eat for the carp when they come across them. It is absolutely roasting today. Um, they're giving it 31 degrees this afternoon, and it seems like an ideal opportunity to talk about sun protection and, and basically uh, what you need to be wearing and what you need to be doing to make sure you don't burn. I don't know if you're aware, but I got diagnosed with skin cancer a couple of years ago, and anyone will tell you, uh, whenever they get diagnosed with a big C, um, uh, the first thing you think is, how long am I gonna live? Is this thing gonna take me? And uh, it is proper scary and um, skin cancer basically has only come about through me overexposing myself to the sun, so basically burning in my youth. You know, if my missus hadn't seen the mole on the back of my arm and we caught it early, it could have been the death of me. It's the reason why I brought these clothes out. This long sleeve top you can see me in now is the second generation of these kind of tops and I wanted something um, like the sea anglers wear when they, when they go out on the boats. Um, and obviously there's no shade there at all for the whole day, but in a more carpy sort of colour. So this top, as basically you can see, has got a zip up, a really high zip up neck on it, almost like a roll neck, which I know you don't want to be wearing when it's red hot, you know, but um, if I was, could cast back 20 years um, and, um, you know, sort of have a word with myself, I would wear this non-stop when I was fishing. Really long sleeves, go right up to the, to the edge of your wrists, you know, this will give you that protection that you need and couple it with a hat. And we do boonie hats as well now, and the boonie hat and, and the tops, um, all the proceeds that come from these products that would normally go into Calder's coffers, go to a children's charity to help kids and their families, kids that are diagnosed with cancer, help them get through it more easily, you know, help them have trips with their families, help their families be able to stay with them um, in hospital. Um, and I think the first year these were out, and it was just, just the buff that we do and the, the original long sleeve top, I think it raised 15 grand for that charity. And I'm sure as the range of these things grow, we'll be donating more and more money to that Lennox uh, Children's Charity. So the other thing obviously is to wear suntan lotion. And I don't like wearing it when I'm fishing. You know, it's hot anyway, you're normally dirty. You know, you're rubbing that into your skin, it feels oily and sticky. It is not ideal, but you need to do it. If, you, if you're gonna be out in the sun for long periods, you know, one bad burn, you know, can set you off on the road to skin cancer. So I normally use the, the kids stuff, the Factor 50, um, you know, that I smother my little girl in when we go on holiday. Um, any of those ones from any, any company, you know, are, are all really good protection from the sun. And I just take skin wipes with me, like the deep cleansing skin wipes, and just wipe it off at the end of the day. You know, we, when we're fishing our normal syndicate lakes, there's no access to showers and that sort of thing. We're all roughing it for two or three days, um, you know, and it can get pretty sort of uh, sticky and uncomfortable but it's just so, so important to do. And you'll see most of the time in this session, I've been wearing long trousers. The combats are very, very lightweight. Um, they were made to be worn all summer long. And whilst they're not as cool as shorts, I've, I've sort of defaulted to the shorts today and put a bit of Factor 50 on the old pins because you know they're gonna be out in the sun. Um, but I've kept in long trousers as long as I can because um, it's just that much better protection. And then finally, the sunglasses. You'll see me in Polaroids all the time. You know, whether you're spending 15 quid on a pair or 50 quid on a pair, you know, I wholeheartedly recommend them, not just for spotting fish in the water, but for watching your rigs go out in the air when it's sunny so you're not squinting, you know, for picking out the marker float, when you're spawning, making sure you're accurate. Like I say, you haven't got to spend the earth. Um, and if you think about sun protection, especially if you're younger, all you lads that are fishing that are teenagers and in your early 20s, that is the time that you can get skin cancer and it will stay in your body until you get to my age, sort of late 40s into your 50s, and it can really give you some problems. So I'm not saying don't enjoy it. Having a suntan is absolutely fine, but just do not burn. Dan to Daryl, come in Daryl. Hello mate, you all right? Yeah mate, good. Um, been a bit of a sort of uh, uneventful day over here, but um, I saw the pictures of that one you had, that was an absolute stunner, mate. Yeah, it's been quite quiet around there really. They were they were in there bubbling, for, like literally first cast I made this morning, massive sheet of bubbles come up straight away, and the first chance sort of 
went begging. I think the rod hadn't gone down, like it must have been sitting badly or something. But um, that take coming this sort of afternoon, but it's the only bit of action I've seen. Yeah, I've put all three out um, long, sort of, sort of late morning, early afternoon, and um, as you probably saw, and um, I don't think I dropped them close enough to the far side. You know, I was worried about going over that really shallow bit where all the rocks are and being too close to the trees. With it being a couple of hundred yards away, I just thought they'd be in the trees. But the fish that we saw, we sent the drone up to get some, um, just some general shots later on, and of course we, you know, we had a look as well while it was up there and the fish were sort of uh, milling around, just odd fish, milling around in the weed, um, sort of quite close to the trees on the far side. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's just like the likely safe zone, isn't it? When it's the furthest point from all the swims, you just, that's where they're gonna be, isn't it? Yeah, but where I've seen them showing before, they were definitely the other side of that really shallow bit, which is like, it's only about, I don't know, a foot 18 inches deep with big rocks on it. And I was just worried if I got a bite beyond it, the fish had kite left or right and cut me off on one of the rocks or do me in the trees, you know? So I was only, I don't know, two rod lengths away from, from where we saw this fish, just as it was sort of sloping back down um, towards me, nice spots. And then the right hand rod was even closer to the tree, so I found a nice bit close to it and still nothing happened. But um, we did notice um, further up the lake, back up near where you started, um, but sort of round the corner from it on the far margin. There's, it appears to be a carp nest up there. There's quite a few hanging around it. So um, this evening I've gone back up there and I had a little donk round with the um, pronged marker lead to see if there's any weed there. And it's lovely and clear and like really firm sand. Um, so I'm gonna fish it probably a couple of rod lengths off the trees tomorrow. Um, with the hope of getting a bite on the last day. But um, how are you feeling for tonight, mate? Do you reckon you're gonna get any more? Well, I baited up pretty early on. I used the bait boat again, got it nice and sort of tight around the float, just cast back over it. One cast each spot, gone down with mega drops. If they're not tangled and the fish are there, they're in trouble. Mate, give us a shout if you get a big one, um, and I'll do the same. We'll have a little chat in the morning, yeah? Roger that, mate. Good luck for tonight. Cheers, bruv. Over and out. That's a liner, that's a liner. It's the final day and you've seen uh, me and Danny doing different tactics. Danny's sort of static in a central swim, changing it up, sort of trying to get as many bites from one swim and you've seen me being ultra mobile and trying to do what I do, you know, find the fish and catch as many as possible. Loads of different tactics employed, all sort of based around summer fishing. And I'm sure if you add these tactics to your own, you know, there's definitely something that anyone can take from this session, implying their own angling in their summer fishing and catch more carp. In there. Here he is. Another scaly little banger from the German snag swim, taken fishing across to the trees, and hopefully there might be another one to come yet. Yeah. Well, the carp nest has produced a bite. Just inching it back away from any weed, done the hard bits, away from the snags. Just walk myself back down to the fish. Oh, this is the area that we called the carp nest out, sort of on the right hand side, underneath the pylons, an inaccessible bit from, uh, from pretty much every swim, unless you do what I've done and boated out a long way. I've changed the leads over from a four ounce distance to a five ounce flat pair, because obviously I'm not casting it. The uh, rig has stayed the same. I've put a, a size two hook on with a curve point just to help it stay in a bit better. And uh, just for a little bit of bait round, I baited up yesterday evening as well because we saw a fish over there. Just sprinkled a little bit of that same mix in. And I've done the same thing again today, just a handful. And I've dropped the rigs probably 
10 yards from where the trees are. No point getting the bite at that range uh, unless you're going to get it in. And it's, uh, it's 250 yards to over there. I use the, I've got a range finder that the golfers use. Fish is still on, I can feel it kicking. And uh, these reels, they only take 270 yards of 15 pound. It's right on the surface, the fish. Long way out though. Yeah, I wasn't surprised that this was the first rod to go, to be honest. Just got to just keep it moving. Such a long battle. If it weeded me up, I could go out in the boat, obviously, and get it, but um, I didn't really want to do that because of the other lines out there. But he's obviously got weed around his head and he's just coming in just slowly, slowly on the surface. Sort of best thing you can do, really, if you've got a, got a little sort of blanket over his eyes and he can't see anything then uh, you just sort of wind him in, which is what's happening at the moment. Lead's obviously come off, because it's right up in the water. We go down and put the net in at the last moment, so hopefully the fish doesn't know the next there until it's too late. If I can get that bit of weed round his face, then it's gonna make the whole thing a lot easier. quite a long way behind that weed bed. See if I can... Yes! Get in! Oh! That was hairy! Only just in the net because of all that weed. Woo! I love it when a plan comes together. Yeah, man. Check that out. A very, very angry 27 pound male mirror. Look at them lovely scales on the flank there. Absolutely gorgeous. And the best bit about this, the bike came at half one in the afternoon. Sun's high in the sky, 30 degrees. And it just shows you, if you change the spot to somewhere where the fish want to be during the day, you can continue the action day and night. So if you pick a swim that's got a lovely margin to it and some open water, you're absolutely laughing. really enjoyed staying put and working the swim and it shows if you go onto a lake where you go into a draw a lot of these holiday commercial venues in France are like that you know and you get a swim and you can't move you have to make the absolute best of that swim and I'm really pleased that I've done that with the way I've baited up and how I fished out in open water you know I've had bites virtually every single night or the next morning right the way through the session what I would do differently here when Daryl moved away from that swim at the far end I would have gone round there during the day when I didn't want to fish in my swim, mark it up, found an area that I could cast down to because there was a lot of fish on that far margin that weren't being fished for at all. So by baiting up that other swim, I could have gone down there for a few hours in the day, been on all of my clips, just baited every single day again to train the fish to feed there during the day, put two rods out for five or six hours and I might have caught more fish that way. I'm out by the nest again. This tactic of walking back just keeps it up closer to the surface because I'm going so high up the bank and just keeps it moving at a steady pace rather than pumping, you know, and keep slacking it off slightly and pumping back in. As usual, the fish is about two feet behind the weed maybe three feet behind the weed. There he is. Not a great situation this, but not a lot else we can do. Just hang on and hope it ties itself out. It's coming a long way already. Just got to be able to see the fish. Sort of down in the water. Funny got it. <laughs> oh, mate. How about that? Knitting it under the water, like a match angler. Get in! Touch, and it's good fish as well. Nice 30. All right, mate, calm down. Calm down. 
Yeah, there we go. I'm so chuffed that the effort of moving the spots and going out super long, taking advantage of the boat has paid off. Look at this amazing 31 pounder. Well chuffed with this one. And um, thank God for Delkins, working on vibration. No lines getting taken whatsoever. I've got them all locked up. So I've got about 20 yards of line left um, and there's loads of snags out there. And anything more than one bleep on the Delkins is a fish on the end. And uh, yeah, just went off two or three times, felt the line, it was bowstring tight. And that was when I uh, wound down as much slack as I possibly could and then just started walking back to get him away from them snags. Ah, oh, result, yes. In this summer's masterclass, we've caught some really nice fish, but there's always certain things that you can take away from a session. And location, it's always the number one thing. You know, we turned up, we found the fish, and I did catch one on that first night. And to be honest, I probably could have stayed in that swim and I probably would have caught, but I did notice that the bulk of the fish that had been there were no longer there. And having been there before, I knew they were very likely to go to that snaggy corner. And like I said in the film, you know, I could easily have fished that swim at night and I would have definitely lost more fish, you know, and that's not good angling. So being able to hop between the two swims, keep bait in both of them, you know, it enabled me to keep those bites coming. And if you find yourself in a snag swim like I was, and you use the tactics that I did, and you'll be able to land those fish from those really snaggy areas. And I'll tell you what, when that buzzer goes, you will know that excitement. What a fight. That, look at that big, it's absolutely having it. Got to be a better one pulling like that. It's a common from the top, crashing. Wow. Oh, we got him, we got him. What a fight. What a battle. Went off and I got it away from the trees fairly easily. And then it decided once it was sort of safe and I'd eased off a bit to really go for it. But um, held on tight and he's still on. Not really ready, but I reckon he's gonna go in. Bosh! <laughs> Get in there! Yes! Yes! Oh yeah! It's a good fish that is. It's a tiny bit under 20 kilos, so it's 43, 43, 12. Wow. Check that out. Oh, I'm absolutely blown away. 43 pounds and probably the very last carp of this year's summer masterclass. Danny has employed tactics, sort of staying stationary, but changing spots, and I've been really mobile, moving around. Obviously, I fish a snag swim, a few little tweaks here and there to, to help me land the fish, and again, fishing in the open water on the gravel spots. So I'm sure there's loads of tactics and loads of tips for everyone, and something that will help put more fish in your landing net. <laughs>